So good evening, everyone. Welcome. This is our uh, next AFDCS Zoom seminar as part of the education series. I'm Michael Lake, Chair of the Education Department, also a member of the AFDCS Board of Directors, and I am pleased to introduce a, uh, what I like to call a neighbor of mine, Michael Dodd, and I say neighbor because we are uh, fellow columnists in First Days, the uh, bi-monthly journal, the American First Day Cover Society, and occasionally our uh, columns run back to back, so it's uh, a pleasure to introduce him here. He is a obviously a member of the AFDCS, also a member of the American Philatelic Society, the Great Britain Philatelic Society, the Internet Philatelic Dealers Association, and a number of other clubs. And as I mentioned, he uh, writes the Great Britain Covers Corner for the Society Magazine. And the presentation this evening, as you can see on the screen, is Great Britain First Day Covers, My Collecting Journey. I've got a sneak preview of it, and it's uh, quite enjoyable, and I'm sure that uh, all of you will find it equally enjoyable and interesting. So with that, Michael, I will toss the floor over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, some of you may have read some of my material, some of my articles in the, in the, in the magazine. Um, I hope you like them. And this is really taking that writing a different step further by actually speaking on, on a topic that, well, lots of topics actually in here that are of particular interest to me. Um, not only first day covers, but as you'll see, some other types of covers that, um, that I'm going to show today. Um, I, I, I enjoy the research that, for, the, for the articles that I write. And um, I, I hope that um, you'll enjoy some of the um, ideas that I'm putting forward today. Um, there's so much that I could cover, um, and I thought I would try and structure it a, a, along, along these um, four points. So where I am now, where I came from, and some of the covers along the way, um, and the experiences that I've had with different cover makers, um, not only um, Royal Mail or the uh, post office, as it was called years ago, um, and perhaps some, some of my own covers as well, because um, I have got into cover making as well. And um, also where the, where the GB market is now and maybe where it might go. And um, some comments and observations, which might be contentious, uh, might be challenging. I'm happy to have people disagree with me. But um, I put them out towards the end um, as something for people to think about. Well, let me start by saying that rather embarrassingly, um, I've done very little with covers for what turns out to be quite a few years. Um, certainly nothing new with Great Britain covers. Um, let me explain and you'll see where I am now, because I'm going to start at the end and then work backwards, as it were because I think that might put a different perspective on it. Um, I'm gonna show GB covers though. I will show some Great Britain covers for you to know where I am. Um, but I'm gonna tell you that my collecting interest has evolved over the years, as I suppose many people's do, and uh, that it's now into aviation. For a long time through the 1960s until about the year 2000, I collected just Great Britain covers people do. Um, but we're looking back on it, that was a long time ago. And perhaps you will see a theme as we go through this. So let's jump right in and look at this, where I am now. There's nothing to do with Great Britain at all, is it? It's a Cathay Pacific inaugural first flight cover um, from um, Hong Kong to Manila. Um, and it's one I designed. It's a flight that I flew on. Um, I designed the uh, cachet, the green cachet in the middle there and, and the box as well. Um, that the handwritten information because um, actually you don't know a lot of this information until right till the very last minute before the flight takes off. Um, and also on this cover, uh, the Hong Kong cancel, it was done at Hong Kong airport. But also on this cover, there's the reverse of the cover. And, um, uh, and I'm showing this in particular because I think it's so important to use the reverse of the cover 
to get some more information. And Foster made made comment of this when he was talking about his Isle of Man covers in in his last talk. So that's one cover. Um, and then I've got Manila to Hong Kong. I managed to fly from Hong Kong to Manila um, with less than an hour turnaround and then fly back again. Pretty crazy, really, but um, it's something that I enjoy doing and I uh, build it. Uh, designing and producing the covers. And there's, there's the back of that cover. The other thing to note is that little scribble down here is actually a signature of the CEO of Cathay Pacific Airways. Um, I worked at Cathay Pacific at the time, and uh, I happened to know a couple of the senior executives and uh, I was able to get him to do that for me. Um, the other thing about flying, and when you've got your covers, you've got to have them authenticated, if you like. And so in this case, there's me getting on the plane and me with the, with the crew, which is a very pleasant experience. And they have covers and they sign them for me. Um, and that is a way of authenticating covers, um, particularly with the, uh, with, uh, some people produce covers and they're not actually 100% genuine, shall we say. And then finally, just one other picture, a little bit of authentication again, the actual um, uh, safety car. I also took a picture on this flight um, of the plane coming into Manila. Um, and just out of interest, you'll see um, up the top here, a place called La Wog. That is where I am right now, it's where I live. And if you've been reading any of the world news lately, you'll probably know that we had a massive earthquake um, about five days ago. Uh, where we live, it was seven on the Richter scale, and it was very, very unfortunate and very, very disturbing, I shall say. Um, we had another one last night in the middle of the night, so if I look tired, that's the reason <laughs> for that. But um, I take these uh, pictures just to add a bit of authenticity. But the interesting thing is, as well, is this is where the embarrassing part comes in. It's six years ago, 2016, as you might have seen on the cover. Um, how did all those years go by and I've done very little with covers at all? Well, COVID put a stop to a lot of that, didn't it? Um, and also uh, I lost some family members in the UK, which is where I'm originally from. And uh, I've just been busy doing whatever one does when one's in lockdown or so. But aviation is my thematic interest now. Um, but it didn't used to be that way. So let me now start to see what I did have years ago and how that evolved into aviation. This is the very first cover that um, <clears throat> I owned because my father bought it for me when we were on a little summer holiday when I was very young, back in 1964 in, in Edinburgh. And we visited what was the opening of the fourth road bridge. There. So uh, um, he, he bought it for me and we mailed it to where we lived in, in, uh, in London, that's where we lived. Because in those days, of course, um, <clears throat> the co a cover was actually physically used. The stamp was used, it was canceled, it was put in the mail and it turned up at your address. Um, I suppose one of the things to think about is, well, it didn't get pen canceled by the post office. Fortunately, it didn't, no, I was quite pleased about that. My cover collecting from there on was through the normal, what I call the normal channel of uh, the, the, the post office and then the Royal Mail first day cover, um, uh, collecting, uh, how do you call it? You sign up and you get a new cover every time there's a new issue. So what I'll do is I'll take you through a few um, of the years, just to show you a, a sample of the covers. And I'll point out some things on them, which I'll try to bring together as a gen general topic towards the end. This is um, one of the first covers um, from the 1970s. Um, and you'll see also on this one, the special hand stamp or cancel or postmark. Um, I know people, all, we all use different words for these, don't we? But um, let's call it the postmark. Um, and in this case, it was um, a, a, royal, a, a post office cover, a 
Royal Mail cover for the 1970s. Um, and then these next two, again, getting a little bit more artistic in the design. This is from the um, Conductors um, series in 1980. And again, you'll see the special postmark from the, po the post office. It said the post office up there hadn't become the Royal, Royal Mail by then. And then this one, again, another lovely cover, but this was um, an official cover produced by um, Benham's, um, now Buckingham's. And, and again, you've got a special cancel, special postmark, beautiful cover, particularly birds is a big interest for thematic collectors. Into the 1990s, this cover was a cover produced by one of the um, cafe makers, cover cover makers, and it's just got the basic um, cancel on it. Whereas this one is the official and now Royal Mail cover, where it's got the Royal Mail um, special hand stamp or special postmark. And it's not that there was only one special postmark, there could have been quite a few. Um, I'll come to that. And this is one more, this is going into the year 2000, um, where again, we've got special cancel. One thing that you will have noticed through all those covers, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, four stamps on the cover, not a lot. Um, distinctive cancels. And I, I think enjoyable to collect because of the, interesting selection of stamps. So this is something that you might want to keep if you don't already know this one. There is a group called the British Postmark Society. And afterwards you can always take a copy of that link or you just Google it and you'll, you'll find it. Where from here you will get a lot of information about all the different postmarks that there were. So as you all know, I'm sure from the catalogs that sometimes Great Britain concise would tell you that there were four or five uh, special postmarks for an issue. But in actual fact, it could have been 10 or 20 postmarks because a lot of other special postmarks were done by people. Um, but let me now talk about a few other covers not produced by the post office or raw mail, but by private cache makers. You may, um, I've already shown a couple, um, but um, there were a, a, a lot made and back in the 70s, 1970s, 80s, 90s, um, there were even more because first day cover collecting seemed to be, from what I understand, a you know, very good business. This next cover um, is from the, 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 the post office at the time, um, it, the, the post office before it became Royal Mail. And it's just a straightforward um, use of a, a postmark from wherever it was produced. It doesn't have a special cancel, but what it does is offer, um, in my mind anyway, the opportunity for um, uh, study and research about why it was canceled, etc. The next one is a different cover, again, from a, 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 a cache maker, with a little circle down the side there that is, is indicative of who it might have been. Um, and again, different, different cancel, but lovely, lovely illustrative um, <clears throat> cancel. Now, the private cache makers or cover makers, in my mind, started to produce the covers that were far more elaborate um, and artistically interesting than perhaps just plain um, post office or Royal Mail ones. Um, and in actual fact, the other thing that some of the wrong, some of the post office covers did um, yeah, was that they, they included um, the inserts. Foster made mention to this, in fact, on his Isle of Mantle. Um, and I think that adds interest to, to the actual covers. Um, so let's just look at one other cover. And as you'll see, it's addressed to my father. Um, and this is what, because in many ways, he was interested in me being able to collect the stamps, but he didn't necessarily have access to uh, all the first day cover 
what the materials produced. So he, he went out kindly, I, I didn't know this at the time, of course, and bought the stamp, and stuck it on an envelope, mailed it to himself, and that, that became a, a first day cover for me, which was rather nice. But anyway, let me just, uh, I've, I've sort of missed a little bit that I wanted to talk about. It's that is by the year 2000, um, the cost of new issues on covers was beginning to get a little bit expensive, I think, in many people's minds, um, because there were so many issues. And I'm thinking here, um, I'm speaking as if it was yesterday, but it's actually only, it's only 22 years ago. Let me just give a, a context here. Um, in, in the UK in 2022, from a quick count so far, there's been nine new issues, and in all, ignoring all the special sheets and presentation packs, the basic number of stamps is around 70 stamps issued. This is just commemoratives. This isn't anything to do with um, definitives. Um, and in my mind, that's rather expensive, especially when postage is around about, say, let's say a dollar. It's, it's impossible to give you an exact number because there's so many different postage rates to different parts of the world, etc. And different sizes of letters, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, anyway, that's it does translate to about seven new first day covers, very big covers, given that you've got to get often 10 stamps or more on. Um, uh, in the US, I was I was interested, surprised to find out that it roughly, and I'm, again, not 100% not exactly difficult to count, there's been 67 new stamps issued, as far as I can tell, as a sign of problem. So it's not actually that much of a difference, except those 67 stamps come across from 22, by my counting, 22 new issues. And my question to myself was, do you actually have a first aid cover for every time there's a new issue? Particularly when a lot of the stamps that are issued are in are just one stamp or two stamps. Interesting, I do find it interesting to wonder how people collect first aid covers in the US if that's the case. Anyway, um, it, as I say, my father ended up buying me the, the, these covers and um, uh, it, they, they take pride of place in my, my collection. And in actual fact, you may or may not have seen it, that I actually used it when I, in one of my articles on the uh, Mashing Definitive series. But let's look at um, a couple of other covers now and to show the next part of my journey, because after stopping collecting covers in the official releases from Royal Mail in 2000, it was, that was my break point. And I, I think my life and my financial circumstances made it that, that I needed to do that. Um, but um, that's another story, I suppose. Um, I ended up specializing into just the aviation that was my interest and you'll, you'll see some of that of why that was a bit later um, and this is just I'm going to show you a few as you can see it's the first flight Great Britain to India and even says the names of the places on there um, it, it, um, it was actually flown to um, it says there Calcutta but today that's Kolkata and uh, still the primary business and commercial financial hub of Eastern India. The cover has the correct postal rate on it and in, in the two stamps that are used, which is often something worth looking into on, uh, on older covers, as, as you may know. Um, and it arrived on the 19th, 9th of April, I think it was, 9th of April. And it's addressed to a chap called Stephen Smith. It's just a Maybe it's just a boring old cover, really, but it's actually a little bit more interesting than that. Stephen Smith, and it's signed by him, Stephen Smith is the father of Indian Rocket Mail, which I don't know whether you don't know about it, but anyway, it's quite interesting. Um, at least the signature looks like his, and I've seen many covers with that have been signed. So uh, that's one that I find quite interesting in my collection. The square box with the RW Lord. I have not been able to find out what that is. I suspect uh, it might be um, a, a dealer's mark or some sort of receipt but on arrival, I'm not sure. This second cover is um, 
from 1939 and for the first transatlantic flight, interestingly enough, it's, it's a bit grubby, isn't it? But it's not necessarily the condition of, of the couple, it's maybe some of the interesting history to it. And, um, uh, the reason I show you this one is, is A, to make that point, but B, to give you something to think about if you know anything about um, Canada and Ontario and Essex. The, the, um, it's backstabbed in Montreal on the 7th of August. Look at that, Montreal, 7th of August, 1939, and then in Essex, the destination address, also on the 7th. But this is what I never could figure out. It was backstamped in Bayfield, Ontario on the 9th of August, two days after it should have been delivered to Essex. And Bayfield is 200 kilometers north of Essex. I actually lived um, in uh, Toronto for quite a while. So I got to know some places. Anyway, I, well, it's just interesting, I think, that um, also that in 1939, mail got from the UK to Canada in four days. I don't think you can do that today. Anyway, <laughs> um, let's just look at one more. Um, and this one's not a not a, a first flight cover. This is a, um, a an anniversary cover. A lot of covers, obviously, are commemorative of an event, commemorative of a person, and sometimes anniversaries. And this is one in particular that's particularly interesting to me because it's got a little bit of nostalgia about it because I was uh, I used to work for. British European Airways. There's the beginning of my aviation interest, if you like. Um, this one, um, 50th anniversary, that makes it 1919. And I wasn't there at the time, but I do have, I couldn't find it to show you, but I do have a, a George V aerial commemorative card um, that was a first flight, the first flight from 19. Um, from London across to Paris. Quite nice, actually, this one. I'm, I, was, I was quite pleased, but I like this one. And one more, uh, and everyone will know this aircraft, of course, the Concorde. I, I uh, worked on the introduction, entry into service of this aircraft back in the day. Um, and uh, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of Concorde covers, of course, but um, I rather like this one. Uh, I think it's quite nice. Interestingly enough, it doesn't have an aircraft on it. It does got it's got the uh, it's got the cars, um, and I do try to find couples that have got aircraft as well as uh, as the theme, uh, but it's not always possible to find. Um, and again, this cover was um, official British Airways cover uh, produced by um, um, uh, the cover the cover company, the cover house. Um, let's. Take a change in pack now of view perspective and look at um, how the cover cover scene has changed over the years. Um, Raw mail covers versus um, cover makers. And this next cover you might recognize is from the International Stamp Exhibition in 1980 in London. Um, and it's the official Raw Mail hand stamp. Um, the thing that was happening now was that covers in this in this period onwards were actually not always addressed or sent through the mail, um, and uh, <clears throat> people could buy the plain cover. In some circles, people believe that without it being addressed, it's worth more. Um, it's I think it's a matter of opinion, really. It's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer. Um, um, Little sticker down the side, down the bottom there, Cameo. This cover was produced by the company called Cameo then. It's now Cameo International, I believe. And it still provides an extremely good quality first day cover um, service for people. This next one, again, a very popular topic, Roland Hill. And again, you've got the, um, this is a, an, another Cameo cover. You've got the official, um, cancel or postmark there on, on, on the uh, official miniature sheet. And uh, like Foster mentioned in his talk, and I use that again, because I thought it was a very good point to make, the, uh, the, the, the cover included an insert with a lot of very useful information on it. 
often um, we we get the we get these covers, and if they haven't got the insert with them, you, you, you've got to do a lot more research, which I find very interesting. But of course, it's good to have a start. So this is uh, the actual insert um, that is on um, on this that was with this this one. Um, let me. So I've talked about covers with one or two stamps, or sort of five, four or five or six stamps. But in but today. Um, this is what you get. Um, it's 10 stamps, isn't it? It's 10 stamps. Um, and it's just a bit heavy, isn't it? Maybe. Everyone sees it differently. Uh, it's, it's a far more graphically designed stamp. Uh, this is again um, by, uh, this is um, by Buckingham Covers, actually, I believe. Um, if we move forward now to about, you know, 2019, we got about 15 new issues a year, down from a high of 20 the previous year in 2018, which I thought was rather excessive. I was glad I had stopped collecting them by then. Um, anywhere from six to 15 stamps in a basic set. Um, not one or two like that I, I see that it happens in the US more often. Um, although I know you do have your big sheets sometimes. Um, how do you get that number of stamps on, on the cover? Well. These stamps are often issued in strips of five or blocks of 10 for that matter. And if this was issued in two strips of five, which I believe it was, um, you've actually got to split the strip. And a lot of people, collectors, will prefer to have the strip intact, I believe. Again, I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong way to do it, but um, uh, I don't think you can please everyone all the time. Um, and it's quite common now to see the stamps split on, on these first day covers that are produced by the big cover houses like um, uh, Stewart still do it, um, Cotswold and Stewart they're called now, and then Buckingham British first day covers um, and GB first day covers. I mentioned these in my articles quite often and I use some of their materials, examples of what can be, what is being produced. Um, very, very high quality in my view. Um, stunning graphics and the covers are, you know, actually quite quite beautiful in in their design. This Star Wars one, um, a bit busy as I said. And it's not exactly my cup of tea, but if the magic interest is Star Wars, then it's obviously a lot of a lot of stamps for you to put into a, a collection. But I'm also seeing another theme now from Royal Mail, and that's this. Now you might say, well, this has been happening for years because I, I know that in uh, other countries, in other countries, or even for Great Britain for that matter, you produce the, just the cover. The person, the collector, buys the cover, and they buy the stamp separately, and they put the stamps on themselves. Um, this is these are the recent issues, actually, from from 2022. Um, where you can just buy the FA Cup. They do not. They did not sell, as far as I know. Um, a cover with the actual stamps already on. Um, I don't know the reason why. I don't want to speculate. Good, I suppose. Um, there's so many stamps to put on them. How did they, you know, can they please people? This way the collector can please themselves. Not, again, not something that I'd be particularly interested in. Um, so there's a few examples. Here's a couple of uh, examples of more modern covers. There's the music giants ones with the rolling stones. You'll see that it's uh, two strips of four, um, a very, very dramatic postmark, and then the same with the cats and, and uh, the FA Cup. Um, looking back and you look at the, the design of the stamps back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, I don't want to sound like nostalgia is the only way, but um, there are some uh, differences between uh, artistic simplicity and the uh, artistic complexity uh, any it's whatever makes makes it good for you i suppose uh, or to to the collector because there is no right or wrong answer so i think i've tried to show that that is how my journey has evolved and what it hasn't some of what it hasn't evolved to but this is where we're really at and this is how my cover collecting journey did change completely this cover was designed by Tony Buckingham of Buckingham Covers. Um, absolutely wonderful man. He passed away a few years ago. Um, 
um, and he and I worked together when, in this case, Singapore Airlines introduced their A380 aircraft um, from Singapore to London. I have flown on a lot of A380s. In fact, I have specialized in first flight covers for, a, for the A380 aircraft. This cover was cancelled um, by the Philatelic Bureau, you can see here uh, in, in Singapore. I got to Singapore early with hundreds and hundreds of Tony's covers, plus my own, and uh, spent many happy hours in the Philatelic Bureau in uh, downtown Singapore and stamping or tearing the stamps off uh, sheets that I bought and then cancelling them. And then I met Tony in London. Oh, I'll come to that in a minute. I met Tony in London and uh, we did some signing. I'll show you those pictures in a minute. And Tony arranged to get the cancel in the UK. Um, again, special cancel that he, he designed. This is a Great Britain stamp. It is a, a genuine first class Great Britain stamp. And this is a, uh, a, a, a label that he had produced against it. You may have seen some of these before they do exist. Talking about the use of the reverse of the cover, again, uh, coming back to the point Foster made, and I, I was very conscious of that when I heard him say it, thinking about that for my talk, but it is so important. You use the reverse of the cover to get some very good information on it and get the history. So I won't, you can read it afterwards if you're interested in all the technical details about this, uh, about this wonderful aircraft. But all, and you can see it's limited, limited print of 500. Um, yeah, I did actually cut, cut, carry quite a lot. But I also signed covers, and this is uh, Tony and I in London. On arrival of the flight, we had the certificate made. And for, in actual fact, for all my um, A380 covers, um, I, I produce my own certificate and I sign it. Um, if, and I also sign the cover as well, if the person that's buying it wants me to sign it. Some people don't want you to sign the covers, some people want you to. The crew signing is different, but me signing it, uh, they don't really want. And then this is one of my covers. I don't think it's anywhere near as good as Tony's, but um, his artistic skills were much greater than mine. And this was one, um, this was also Singapore to London, the same, the same flight. This is the one I carried. You'll see the, um, the, the, the Shanghai Airport cancel um, and uh, uh, at this time, I got it signed by a cap. There were two, two captains on the plane and two senior first officers. Um, and uh, I, I, was, I, got, I spent quite a bit of time flying Singapore Airlines and I did get to know the crews quite well. Um, and here's one more to prove how, my, how well I got to know the crews, which you might find interesting. Uh, this, this, this actually, um, you're being extremely observant, was. Um, taken in, um, in Sydney on the arrival of the very, very first flight, A380 commercial service from Singapore to Sydney. So that was the crew holding uh, one of the covers that I had designed there. Um, and then we all flew back to Singapore. So I was on both flights. I couldn't miss it, could I? Um, pretty crazy world. And if I had kept just, kept just Great Britain first day covers, I might not have spent as much money as I did flying on Singapore Airlines. But, um, it was fun at the time. Anyway, um, also, oh, there's a couple of others. There's one of me um, signing, there's Tony's covers, that's a different cover he had produced. There's all, all the authenticity I was telling you about earlier of um, um, the crew uh, signing the covers for me. Um, uh, any person that buys one of my covers um, also gets copies of the photographs as, as part of the authenticity. Um, I won't bore you anymore with that. I'll talk finally with a, this, last, this last cover because this cover is from the Joint Services Charities Consortium, um, which raises funds for the Royal Air Force Association. So it's not only collecting covers in my mind from official sources like the Royal Mail or privately produced from cache houses or you know, cover houses, or maybe people like me, many others that we all know about, particularly through the, the bulletin, the first, first flight covers, first day covers group. Um, 
this one is a, a charity and I, one that I support and I think it's a very interesting one. And they produce some quite interesting covers. And in this case, they've actually able, not only able to get the stamp VC10 engines on it, um, but the lovely, um, lovely postmark, I think. Um, and they also had some nice cancels on the back and a little bit more information and, and then the number issued. That's something I do on my covers as well. I also put the number issue. So let me close with a few remarks, maybe controversial, but I mean them in a very friendly way. Um, and it's just my thinking and it's open to debate and, and even disagreement. I'm happy to have disagreement. And this is not exhaustive, otherwise I'd be here for another hour or two. But um, there are a number of factors at play and I'm gonna pick on three that I think are um, quite relevant in today's Great Britain cover market. One is that collectors having to face the fact that there are, in some people's minds, just too many um, new issues. Um, the cost may be, be kept, may be just be too much for people to collect. Um, um, uh, it's 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 hard to say, it's, it, and it's, it's it's an individual situation. Isn't it? Um, I could give you some examples, I suppose, on um, issues are extremely expensive because in the UK, it's not just a first class stamp or you know a, a first class or second class local stamp. The cost for overseas mail is, is extremely expensive, I think, in some people's minds. But maybe the answer is just to focus on a collecting habit, maybe. Just, so, you know, a, a topic of interest, shall we say, a thematic interest. Um, but also a second point, in the years ahead, um, However, we look at it, there is going to be a change in the monarchy. There may be a reason then for people to just stop buying new issues completely. Or it may be there'll be more people come into the hobby because they'll be buying kings instead of queens um, issues. Uh, it's hard to say, but there is a change um, dynamic that's going to happen in the future, and that may affect um, collecting. And thirdly, the recent barcoded definitive stamps that you may well be familiar with, um, they're also on Christmas issues. Are they going to be um, more commonly produced by Royal Mail on commemorative issues? A lot of people don't like them. They don't like the style, the additional piece of paper attached to the actual, so shall we say, design of the stamp. Um, I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm saying that it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an element that might influence people's collecting interest. So many people that I have heard and read just have stopped collecting definitive stamps. Personally, I don't collect these anymore. As soon as they started, the end of the machines came and that was the end of my machine collection, so to speak. Anyway, it's all one for the individual. Anyway, it's also speculation. And maybe things to look out for and things to think about how we, if we are the collector, want to collect our stamps, or if if it's our if we're if we're sellers or dealers, um, what our buying public might want, and how we focus our own selling to meet the potential demands of the collectors. However, we sort of try and sum up. I've covered an awful lot of material on a lot, a lot of ground and different focuses all the way through this. I hope it's not, I haven't jumped around too much for you. Let me, I think I've got six points. The future of the GB modern material, the commemoratives, in many respects, is just too much to collect um, and it's not cheap by any measure. Older covers from the 1960s through to the 1990s are close to what I call, and forgive me, junk bond status. Collectors are dumping them in many cases. And I've often said, in fact, over the last 20 years, I've said to people, you can buy Great Britain commemoratives at less than face, used or empty. Um, and people in, enjoy their collecting going back in time by buying the stamps now instead of having bought them at the time. Interesting thought, maybe. Um, the number of covers being produced in recent years is what I think reached saturation point. One of my, well, one of our colleagues, the uh, first day cover, is interested in the uh, Freddie Mercury Queen covers. 
and I looked into how many covers I could get for him. And the, uh, the sum was quite, um, quite astronomical, I was quite surprised. And that's just, um, just one cover, you know, produced by different cover makers, different designs, etc. Um, there's, um, there's a new norm, as I call it, uh, and that is that people might start changing their interest to focus on a, on, on a theme. In fact, if you use me as an example again, not that I'm not only I'm not specifically looking at um, aviation covers. I've actually focused that down now because of where I live and, uh, and of an interest I've now further developed in, uh, with respect to being in the Philippines. And that is, uh, I've got an interest in the Pacific Clipper service covers from uh, San Francisco, from America, right the way through um, um, Guam, Midway, down to uh, Manila and then on to Hong Kong. So I've gone from, you know, all the Great Britain covers that they used to produce right down to aviation covers and that uh, first flight covers. Now I'm really only focusing on the, um, the Clipper service covers, Pan Am Clipper service covers. And there's more than enough to keep me very occupied and uh, enthused in terms of the research and reading uh, that, I, that I can do on. And finally, at the end of the day, the cover is for whatever interests you um, and whatever provides you with hours of reading and learning and pleasure. There is no right or wrong. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I hope I haven't been boring. I hope um, there's been some context flowing through this. Um, it was a bit challenging to put it together so that I covered off so many different things. So thank you very much. You can reach me there. I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, I'll pass it across to Michael because I know he wants to uh, say a few words. Well, thank you, Michael. And just a, uh, a quick plug here for the AFDCS on the end. Terrific organization that uh, many of you obviously are a part of, but uh, for those that uh, might be watching this who are not, access to the journal, Member Connect, annual cache contest, just a whole host of benefits FDCS provides and at a very affordable rates and just an enjoyable organization to associate and collaborate with collectors like Michael and, and many others. So at this point, I'll invite everybody to unmute. You're welcome to stop sharing if you want, Michael, and we'll be able to see everybody and uh, fire away with questions. I'll just say that I really appreciate those inserts in the covers yes. that I get from uh, Great Britain. I wish there were more over here that would do that. And it's nice to know how many were produced and they'll tell you what not, you know, which number it is. And um, it's really helpful, especially if you exhibit and they want, you know, they want you yes. to tell everything about the cover and you know, I've collected uh, quite a bit in uh, the US on women in space and some of the covers I've purchased, you can't even tell who the cache maker is. And, you know, I've asked a lot of people, nobody knows, but I use yeah. them anyhow because I like them. <laughs> mm. You know, they fit into my exhibit. That's a good point. Yeah, it is. I find sometimes I get covers and I, I have no idea who produced it. There's nothing in there of any relevance and the thing about some covers is that they are, have a cancel on them postmark mm -hmm. and you think why have they got that postmark what's the relevance is there a relevance and in some of the articles that i write for the um, magazine i will talk about it's taken me hours sometimes to do the research but i find out bird avia bird covers are very interesting that the reason they got this cancel is because that bird, one of the birds on a stamp, actually is very rare in that particular neighborhood. And so that's why they got it covered. But you'd never know that without, as yeah. you say, without having a good insert. Yeah, good point, good point. I'd like to comment on the uh, number of stamps that uh, postal services are issuing. As a cachet mm. maker, when I, when I get a, an issue with five stamps or 10 stamps, in the issue, I've got to say to myself, am I going to make one cache or am I going to make 10? Mm -hmm. And in a marketing sense, if you make that five or 10, half of them are going to be unpopular. 
America was mm -hmm. And so lately, I've been of the mind that I'm just going to make one cache. I think it's interesting to see how things will evolve because at the end of the day, you've also got to say, well, it might be five stamps or 10 stamps, but how many covers, how many caches do you make? And when I was producing the, um, the A380 covers, I probably, did, most often I didn't produce more than 20. Um, I might have produced a couple of covers, a couple of different designs, but I couldn't, if you start producing too many, uh, it, there's a lot of cost if you don't sell. And as you say, if you've got too many stamps, then how many covers do you make? I think mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's a question that was a challenge for us. Yeah, I, over here, yeah. I, I, I second your opinion that there's, a, there's too many new issues coming up from the UK. And um, I, I collect science fiction on stamps. And so, of course, the UK's had the Doctor Who issue, two Star yeah. Wars issue, a Star Trek issue. And I uh, estimated that it cost me uh, 200 US, with the equivalent of 200 US dollars to get one of each item that was going to get either a Gibbons or Scott catalog number from the Star yeah. from the first Star Wars issue alone, right? And then yes. to make things, to make things even uh, more expensive, there's not just the Royal Mail they cancels, and there's always two: one from Wales and one no one from Edinburgh at Talents House, and one from London, right? Um, there's not just the two first day cancels, but various first day cover makers or dealers yes that's right cancels, right so you could wind up collect you could wind up having them to collect uh, as many as 10 different first day cancels for one issue which means correct ten stamps that's on exactly each right that's exactly right and if you look at the, the postmark um magazine uh bulletin that i showed that i gave you the link for or just google it you'll find there could be 10 10 or more as you say, cancels. There's a there's a blog sometimes. Um, I don't know if you know Ian Norvik, um, lovely man. Again, uh, he, he 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 often writes about the number, about the uh, the postmarks that are being produced for a particular cover. Very interesting. If you don't know him, have a look at Norvik. You will find him. Yeah, yeah, good point. And it's not not just Greg Vernon. While I was putting together my Owl Man presentation. 1970s, usually two stamps per issue. Now, yes. 10, 12. Yes. Good news for the Iowa man, also for the US, is that generally only one first day cancel. Uh, mm -hmm. Makes it a little bit right. easier. Well, US ha has one first day city, but then, then they'll have a machine cancel, hand cancel, digital cancel. And of course, some of us will go out and do unofficial locations. So it adds up here, too. That's right. Personally, I, I kind of like the 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 early uh, Frank Burning covers you showed, where where people just cancel them in various locations, and probably a good research project to figure out why. Yes. Someone's just asked: Do first day covers exist for pre? I can't remember what it said now. Pre something or other. And the, uh, uh, and I take it you mean like pre? I don't know. Queen Elizabeth. Pre Elizabeth. Second, yeah. Yeah. The mm -hmm. answer is yes, but the answer is sort of not quite yes because they weren't produced exactly as we see them today. People would um, create them and have them cancelled or written on them. I haven't got one handy, but I have got them where someone writes first day cover on it with the cancel date is the date. Of it. So you'll find that from anything going back through George V, Edward, even Queen Victoria. But they weren't produced as we know them, uh, as we know them today. Having said that, of course, there are some that were produced for special events. Um, George the Sixth, in fact, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, um, Olympic Games and whatever others there were that were, that were produced, and they they can be quite worth quite a lot of money, especially if they're in very good condition. So it's sort of a, a yes, but not as definitive a yes as they are produced today, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Whoever asked the question? I've done a, 
it gives me the idea I can I can do an article on that as well. I have done one article on I think it was George the Sixth covers. I can't remember now. I have done that. I'll, I'll, if that's of interest, I can I can I can do that. I was also interested in. You said you were concentrating now on clipper covers. Yes. In the Pacific uh, area. Yes. Can you? expand on that a little bit i mean what kind of where are you getting these covers and, and uh, what, what do they represent um uh, well i'm just saying are they are they first flight covers or yes that yes yeah. 1935 first flight covers signed by edwin uh, what's his name the first one of the major uh, pan am pilots that flew the uh, clipper service down um Different, there were different flights, there were different first flights. Um, there were, there's all the legs of the flights going down from San Francisco to Midway to Guam um, to uh, Manila, Manila on to Hong Kong. So, and what they did in those days, they produced a cover that they flew on just the one leg. Someone was flying from A to B, so they flew there. Um, and so I tried to find covers that um, they got different stamps on them. They've got um, different cancels. Some of them have got the same, um, and I, I get them. I get I get them from eBay. I um, subscribe to an auction house in the UK that specialises in Philippine stamps, and as part of their service, they have flight covers. Um, and I, I don't. I just you know I can keep my eyes and eyes open and, and see what's happening and I, I try to read about the the history I um I did a I write a I write an article a series of articles on aviation on stamps uh, it's got it in my bio there um, if you're interested um, <clears throat> so I write I pick an aircraft or I pick a place and I'll write about that aircraft and the different countries that have issued the stamp with that aircraft on it. I've done the Constellation, for example. Uh, I've done the Comet. Um, I'm currently doing an aircraft called the Vanguard, a Vickers Armstrong aircraft. I've, I've been a bit biased towards you British aircraft. Um, but yeah, I, but the, the Philippine the Philippine leg is and the Philippine is interesting to me. I've also um, I've also taken a little bit of an interest in the early Spanish flights <clears throat> to the Philippines because um, the history of what those guys did when they tried flying all that way with these aircraft is uh, unbelievable. And I've actually been to visit places in the Philippines where the flights came into. The, 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 there's no the seaplanes, most of them, back in the 1920s. Um, we, we went to one place called Apari. If you ever look it up, you'll find it's quite interesting. And we just could not find where anything about this aircraft flight coming in. And then as we're driving down the road, my wife suddenly stop, stop. There's a little signpost, you know, like a headstone in the corner of the road. And, uh, and there it was, all written up about this pilot that flew in. It's all residential housing now. But she suddenly saw it out of the corner of her eye. Quite remarkable it was. I wrote about that and uh, the photographs and whatever, and I've got covers. Um, I say eBay usually. Well, Michael, thank you again. Much my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. Terrific session. Thank you, everyone.